Hello, my name is Rick Olson, and I was going through my computer, and I just saw a file that my brother had sent me a few years back of something he found online that our dad had written in 1948 in Czechoslovakia. In 1948, he went to Czechoslovakia, studied, and my mom was with him too. They were students at the University of Minnesota. Just after that, they were graduate students at Harvard. Anyway, he wrote this article about the 1948 communist uprising revolution in Czechoslovakia. He covers that calendar year. And it's a little bit of an academic student article, but it's a really good profile on what the Communist Party did to the media, for example, during that time. And I believe it's, as it stands, it's it's a half an hour of a um, computer voice reading his article. I edited out the pauses to make it flow. So it's a historical record of the Czech Revolution as it stands, but there's also some parallels to what's happening right now with all the media shutdown, censorship, etc. Um, but I don't want to tease that too much. I'll let you spot what that is. All right. So my dad, Kenneth G. Olson, Kenny G. Yeah. After 1948, uh, in the 50s, he, he, he was in Harvard grad Harvard grad school and the Navy as an intelligence officer. Then in the 60s, like when I was born, he was a professor at Smith and a political consultant in public policy. And he was a speechwriter to Humphrey in 1968, who would have been an ambassador had Humphrey won. But there's a parallel of 1968 to 2020 in that the, the Democrats put forward a corporate candidate that's not popular and enforcing it through and it's you know and in 1968 Nixon won so let's see what happens anyway we'll roll this radio free Europe recording of Kenneth G Olson and the propaganda in the Czech revolution in 1948 and 1948 was the same year um, 1984 was written and it's really the same scenario. I, I don't want to name too much about today. Uh, if you know, you'll, you'll hear it. It's like jazz. If you don't know, I can't tell you. I have to leave it at that. Published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Association for Public Opinion Research, April 1, 2014, 10.06. American Association for Public Opinion Research and Oxford University Press are collaborating with JSTOR to digitize, preserve and extend access to the Public Opinion Quarterly. Development of the Czechoslovak Propaganda Administration by Kenneth G. Olson Recent seizure of power by the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia offers another opportunity to study the construction and operation of a propaganda machine in a totalitarian state. This article divides the Czech propaganda administration functionally into planning, implementation, and control, and describes the way in which each of these funk tie-ins was integrated into the new communist state. It also discusses briefly the backgrounds of some of the principal figures who operate and control this newly developed propaganda machine in Czechoslovakia. The author, currently a graduate student in political science at the University of Minnesota, gathered material for this article while studying at Charles University in Prague in I-948. He has also served as a reporter for the ST Hall Pioneer Press and as a stringer in Europe for International News Service. This article is part of a larger work on propaganda in Czechoslovakia, now in preparation. A chief task of the communist government of the New People's Democratic Republic of Czechoslovakia has been the creation of a coordinated propaganda policy as an instrument for gaining and perpetuating power. The strategic goal, for at least the first 10 months after the so-called February 1948 coup d'etat, was primarily one of consolidation, the concentration of the greatest possible power within the hands of the new ruling elite, and the coordination of that power with the Soviet Union and her satellite states. Propaganda was utilized as a technique of power consolidation in every phase of political and economic life. It was used, together with other forms of coercion, in the consolidation of power within the very agencies which themselves created propaganda. The pertinent problem here is that of propaganda administration. 
What was the nature of communist propaganda agencies, their organization, and their funk tie-ins? These questions will be explored in this article for the period of February through December 1948. They will be considered under the headings of planning, implementation, and control. Consolidation of the Propaganda Administration The development of a propaganda administration from a myriad of independent agencies into a well-integrated system followed roughly the following pattern, i. Immediate concentration of authority over all channels of communication at one point. This phase of consolidation followed the February coup d'état immediately, and certain publications were banned or merged, publishing houses were nationalized, and many anti-communist communications experts were purged from their posy tie-ins. The process of concentrating these media under one authority was a relatively simple procedure, since from I-945 onward stringent press laws had already eliminated most privately published periodicals, and the state had extended its control over the radio, cinema, public opinion, surveys, and other channels. 2. Integration of communication media under a single central authority. This somewhat later phase of consolidation was characterized by attempts to coordinate various communications agencies. What resulted was a further alignment of the press, radio, cinema, and minor institutions into a single system. Propaganda activities of semi-independent organizations, such as the trade union movement, the youth movement, the Sokol organization, and others, were incorporated into a vast national scheme with lines of responsibility and control leading at least formally to the government executive. 3. Maximization of control to facilitate the implementation of poll IC and to produce the greatest possible desired effects. This advanced position was reached by the autumn of I-948, after initial concentration and integration were near completion. The functions of planning M. Plementation and control of propaganda were divided among various agencies. Much effort was devoted to continuous evaluation of the propaganda network and its effectiveness, public criticism and self-criticism were encouraged. Research agencies began to analyze effects of propaganda upon the Czech and Slovak audiences. The propaganda process during this phase of consolidation was largely, and continues to be, one of introspection to achieve maximum results. Centralization, integration, and control form the chronological pattern of the consolidation of propaganda organization, but it is obvious that this process involved constant interaction of more than one of these factors at any given time. As late as October 1948 centralization was not yet completed, for at least one significant independent periodical fostering a non-communist ideology was being published, subject only to the incidental control of propaganda authorities. Nor had integration of the daily press and the opinion press been completed by December 31, I-948. The Syndicate of Czechoslovak Writers, a branch of the Propaganda Administration, held several meetings in November 1948 to consider the feasibility of merging several periodicals in what already was a fairly completely functionalized press scheme. Striving for greater effectiveness of control is a never-ending process, and it constitutes one of the chief problems for propaganda administrators. Hesitancies in tactical maneuvers characterize the period of consolidation of the Czechoslovak communist propaganda network. The organizational structure which has evolved reflects many inconsistencies inherent in the process of consolidation. The emerging administration, nevertheless, has evidenced special characteristics in its delegation of authority into the fields of planning, implementation, and control. The chief task here is to investigate these three facets of administration as to their organization, personnel, functions, source of authority, responsibility, and perhaps, their effectiveness. Propaganda Administration Planning At the outset it may be stated that the planning function within the Czechoslovak Propaganda Administration is largely, almost entirely, that of the Communist Party and not of the government. Policy MAC ING is carried out at three levels, by the International Communist Information Bureau, Come and form, located in Bucharest, by one of the three Czechoslovak delegates to the Come and form, Gustav Bears, and by a small number of ad hoc party agencies responsible to Bears. The role of government planning in propaganda is restricted to an advisory capacity. One of the crucial questions concerning the administration of propaganda in Czechoslovakia in I-948 is where the source of Propa won this publication, the irregularly published Najee Doba, Our Time, has been edited by Dr. Frantisek Lichter and Dr. Joseph Masek, a pair of influential, nonpartisan Prague economists. In the September 1948 issue, 
Nace Doba printed an article which implied the manipula ton of foreign trade statistics by the Czechoslovak government for political purposes. Two chief reasons have been advanced for the continued existence of this review, the influence and personal prestige of its editors and the possession of a private stock of newsprint. Ganda authority is located. There has been a tendency for most non-communists to assume that any question of policy concerning world communism emanates from the propagandists of the Soviet Communist Party. This would be difficult to prove and is probably a gross oversimplification. Czechoslovak communist leaders are the first to admit that they gain ideological inspiration from the Russian communists, and they urge their followers to see the history of Russian Bolshevism as the doctrinaire guide to creating a socialist state in Czechoslovakia itself. It is probable, however, that Soviet influence is communicated through various intermediate channels. Ostensibly as a guide for communist activity throughout the world, and as an information center, the Communist Information Bureau, or Come and Form, as it is more popularly known, was created in autumn I-947. This organization, in the opinion of many, represented a victory for aggressive, international communism over the older, more moderate nationalistic type which was born of necessity after the failure of world revolution in the early I-920s. Whether those leaders, representing the common form point of view control the Politburo of the Soviet Communist Party cannot be proved here. The fact is that communist policy throughout the world within individual national parties, Czechoslovakia included, coincides completely with that initiated by the common form. Data. The common form is the real source of authority for Czechoslovak communist policy and consequently is the real source of authority for the propaganda implementing that policy. The primary importance of the common form and propaganda planning in Czechoslovakia may be illustrated in two ways. Chief propagandist Bears Gustav Bears is generally acknowledged as the chief propagandist in Czechoslovakia today. As one of the three Czechoslovak delegates to the common form, he has access to the authoritative source of world communist policy. Bears, perhaps, even shares in creating or modifying that policy at meetings of the organization in Bucharest. In addition to his most important position with the common form, he is a member of La there is the exception of Marshal Tito's Yugoslav Communist Party which has been censured by the common form consistently since June I-948 for bourgeois tendencies, increasing nationalism, economic cooperation with the American bloc, and other reasons. In recent months there has been much speculation over the degree of autonomy exercised by the Communist Party in China. The Czechoslovak Communist Party's Central Committee, chief of that committee's agitation and propaganda, Agitprop, Commission, Press Chief of the Central Action Committee of the National Front, Editor-in-Chief Otvorba, Official Communist Party Weekly Magazine, and an author of Wide Influence. Bears holds no governmental post, save the quasi-official one with the Central Action Committee, and yet his influence is great in all phases of political and economic life. The role of Bears is that of planning propaganda policy for Czechoslovakia within the limits designated by the common form. It is known that his plans are subject to the approval of Rudolf Slansky, Secretary General of the Czechoslovak Communist Party, and another delegate to the common form for each manuscript written by Bears is reviewed by Slansky before publication. Yet Slansky's influence must be viewed as one of aligning propaganda planning with the general action pro gram of the party and of the government. It is unlikely that Slansky's authority extends to veto power in matters of propaganda, but rather probably is limited to an advisory capacity in this respect. Again, whether propagandist Bears or action director Slansky follows come and form policy to the letter or is allowed some degree of originality cannot be answered here. It is evident that while Bears continues to be except able to the come and form in the role of chief Czechoslovak propagandist, broader propaganda planning, at least, will continue to conform to that of the Information Bureau in Bucharest. Submission of local propagandists The conformity of the propagandist himself to the common form is identical with the conformity of the propaganda. An outstanding example is the now famous violation of common form policy by the Czechoslovak Communist Party in late summer I-948. The common form, AP apparently deciding that propagandists of the Czechoslovak Communist Party were not performing their tasks satisfactorily, on September, I launched a bitter attack in the pages of its organ for a lasting peace, for a people's democracy, two against functioner, party organ in Czechoslovakia, maintaining that this magazine made little use of criticism and self-criticism for the purpose of combating conceit, smugness, the habit of issuing commands, the common form accused functioner of.
To this somewhat awkward title is usually replaced by come and form journal when described in the English language, failure to learn from the masses, and to listen to their voice, and the practice of devoting scant attention to the struggle for the purity of the party. Other shortcomings indicted were the lack of theoretical and propaganda articles, lack of historical treatises on the Russian and Czechoslovak communist parties, and lack of descriptions of the organization of party education. The common form declared that outspoken basic criticism of the shortcomings in the work of the branches, the party committees, and of individual functionaries would help to overcome and eliminate these shortcomings. Three several days later functioner admitted its mistakes, recanted, and pledged itself to fulfill its mission according to common form direction. The final step in the affair was an appraisal of criticism and subsequent reform in the common form journal of September 15, I-948, under the headline, Measures to improve Czechoslovak Party Journal. This article, approving the acceptance of come and form suggestions, indicates the triumph of come and form propaganda policy over that of individual party functionaries within Czechoslovakia. Lowest in the hierarchy of propaganda planners in Czechoslovakia is a group of ad hoc agencies which supplement the work of the Bears Group in outlining procedures. Although it has been possible to gather but fragmentary evidence concerning their role in the propaganda ad, Administration, it is known that they are wholly outside the governmental structure of the nation, have a temporary, ever-changing nature, and serve to direct planning along specific lines as indicated by the Bears Group. Chief example of such an agency is that administered by Yuri Ronick, a recent convert to communism, but long a man of great personal prestige in Czechoslovakia, who is General Director of the State Press and Information Services, Director of the CTK News Agency through which flows all foreign news, and Secretary General of the International Organization of Journalists. Ronick, whose position with IOJ has been protested by the American Newspaper Guild on the ground that he is a communist, has been described as the official watchdog over the press, for it is believed that Ronick's supervision X S the common form attack, which stated that Functioner did not draw the attention of the party as a whole to the need for a more careful scrutiny of applications for party membership came as the Czechoslovak Communist Party was launching its internal party purge which was aimed at the eviction of an estimated I-400,000 persons from membership, according to party spokesman. Tens beyond press planning to the cinema as well, and he is said to be influential in propaganda planning for radio. A man named Zdenek Novak, a party leader for more than 20 years, holds the semi-official title of director of the spoken word, and it is he who plans radio policy. Not one Mrs. Kodatkova who possesses the figurehead title of editor-in-chief of the Czechoslovak radio. It has been stated that the role of government in propaganda planning is restricted tone advisory capacity. While its personnel do not take an active part in policy making, there are several communist party veterans who, by virtue of their high governmental posts and their long experience in directing communist revolutionary propaganda, do influence planning to a varying extent. Six government officials may be singled out for consideration in this context. Point five: Clement Gottwald, president of the Czechoslovak Republic since June 1948, writes frequently for various periodicals, and his autobiog, Rafi, 10 years, is required reading in all classes on Marxism-Leninism in Czechoslovakia. Editor of the Slovak communist organ, Pravda, between 1920 and 1925, he is held in high repute as a propagandist except for his nationalist deviations from common form policy. Antonin Zapataki, Prime Minister and Chairman of the Revolutionary Trade Union Movement, which combines all manual and intellectual workers, is close to Gustav Beers and Rudolf Slansky ideologically, and his published articles indicate internationalist communist tendencies. Vaslav Kopecky, Minister of Information, and before World War II an editor of Rud Prudvo, communist daily newspaper IH Prague, is director of propaganda control services the task his ministry largely performs. Zdenek Nijedli, minister of education, is editor of VAR, a personal intellectual monthly periodical, a radio commentator, and an influential man of letters. Vlado Clementis, minister of foreign affairs, and Julius Duris, minister of agriculture, are both veteran communist journalists, whose work appears often in the Czechoslovak press. Five biographical material presented here is taken largely from the Committee on Foreign A Affairs, H.R.S.U.B.C. Number 5, National and International Movements, The Strategy and Tactics of World Communism, Supplement 3, Country Studies, A. The Coup d'état in Prague, Washington, 1948, 
p. 20. The prestige of this group of six in world communism is indicated by the fact that all except Clementes and Duras have spent long periods of time in the Soviet Union, and Gottwald, Zapataki, and Kopecki served as delegates to the Comintern on several pre-war occasions. On the whole, however, they are identified with communism of the indigenous Czechoslovak type, and from this their prestige as propagandists within their homeland proceeds. It is the belief of most OB servers that the role of the six men cited is restricted to an advisory capacity in current propaganda administration. At the same time they are important in the implementation of propaganda policy, for their opinions are widely read and respected by Communist Party members in Czechoslovakia. Propaganda Administration Implementation The implementation of propaganda policy created by the common form and by the bear's hierarchy is carried out by personnel who actually operate the media of mass communication. Policy is outlined to a group of chief editors, writers, and radio officials at weekly conferences in party headquarters in Prague. Obviously a technical problem arises in coordinating policy changes within the press which consists of some 1,200 periodicals, of which 9 are Prague and I-8 provincial daily newspapers. Point six policy conferences are usually attended by editors of the chief Prague dailies, and it is the responsibility of the remainder of the press, the cinema, and other media, to watch for policy changes and bring themselves into line. Rude Prevo, the chief communist daily, published in Prague with I-8 regional editions, is first to reflect policy changes. Its editorial staff includes several leading communist writers whose chief work is to transmit propaganda to the public. Vilem Novi is editor-in-chief of Rude Prevo, but since he became a National Assembly deputy and chairman of its Foreign Affairs Committee, direction of the newspaper has fallen to an assistant, Vojtech Dolecsi. Senior foreign editor is André Simon, formerly Autocats, who has the reputation of being one of the most able international communist propagandists. An agitator and publicist in France, England, and Mexico at various times, Simone returned to Prague shortly before the February I-948 crisis to become the chief spokesman on matters of Czechoslovak foreign policy 6 series KF The New Organization of the Czech Press, Prague, 1947 In the press, Kamil Winter, young assistant foreign editor on the staff, specializes in propaganda attacks upon the United States, which he has studied thoroughly but never visited. There are many other writers and radio commentators who are essential to propaganda implementation, but one more list may be cited. The Ministry of Information on October 28, I-948, announced that it had offered awards to a group of young journalists for meritorious work. The list included Vaslav Slavik of Rudpridvo, Miroslav Goluska of Tvorba, Antonin Vavris of Rolny Klesi, Joseph Turk of Lidov Novini, Karel Biba of the Czechoslovak Radio, Alois Svoboda of Rav Nost, ING. Arno Kraus of Zemedalsk Novini, Rudolf Zajak of Pravda, Pavel Turkin of Pridga and Budavadl, and Lt. Vladimir Kaspar of Abrana Lidu, all figured prominently in propaganda work after the crisis, and their work shows complete ideological conformity. Problems of propaganda implementation The implementation of propaganda encountered two serious problems during the ten months after February. The first was the inability of either the Bears planning hierarchy or of the Ministry of Information which became the control mechanism to exert any significant control over the activities of many individual communist journalists during the first weeks of consolidation in March and April I-948. The zeal and individual initiative with which minor-level propagandists carried out ideological attacks upon enemies of communism often left a gap between propaganda planning and propaganda implementation. Acting only within a very general ideological framework, many communist journalists made statements which contradicted each other often lead ING to general confusion. It was largely this problem which prompted the strengthening of the Ministry of Information as a control agency, entrusted with maintaining a greater degree of uniformity in thought. Manipulation. The second problem was that posed by non-communist or anti-communist journalists who remained, through the need of their technical services, on periodical and radio staffs. After a thorough purge of anti-communists, pressure was brought to bear upon remaining non-party members during summer I-948 to join the Communist Party or face being discharged. Conformity within journalist ranks had been achieved by about September I, I-948, when it was announced that Stanislav Budin, foreign editor of Lidov Novini, 
and a non-communist who had lived in the United States for many years had recanted and had become a party member. Point seven. Budin represented those journalists who, because of personal prestige and indispensable skill, continued in active propaganda work without being totally accountable to the bear's hierarchy. Their deviations from the propaganda line were often a source of embarrassment for the propaganda administration at all levels until the control mechanism was streamlined and strengthened. Propaganda administration. Control. It has been pointed out above that certain problems existed between the administrative levels of planning and implementation, which limited the effectiveness of consolidation propaganda within Czechoslovakia. A strengthened role was delegated to the Ministry of Information in the late spring of 1948, when it was entrusted with the coordination of all propaganda implementation. The Ministry of Information originally was created by multi-party agreement in 1945 to allocate newsprint supplies. And to license all periodicals. From the beginning, it was headed by Václav Kopecky, a communist who was widely respected by the leaders of all five political parties then existent, but who entrusted communist party members with key ministry posts. The ministry is divided into eight functional sections: general information, press, publications, broadcasts, film and records, foreign cultural relations, people's education, and finally thea, ter, art, and music. Their work is directed by Kopecky with the assist ants of a presidium composed of Dr. Frantisek Novak, the general secretary, several communications experts, and the section heads. It may be said generally that each section controls propaganda activities in the medium for which it is responsible, to the extent that it checks for policy implementation and reports uniformity or deviation back to the planning agencies. In the case of radio, for example, the radio SEC tie-in outlines certain ideological bounds within which each of the three Czechoslovak broadcasting stations may develop propaganda, and it further exerts control by checking actual content at the time of broadcast. In the case of periodicals, the check is made largely after pub. Seven in a Twarba article quoted by Gaston Koblenz, New York Herald Tribune, Paris edition, September I, 1948, p3. Lycation, with suggestions and criticisms given by the ministry to ensure future conformity with policy. On the legal side, provisions of the new Czechoslovak Constitution, Tian, promulgated on June 9, I 948, and the new law for the Protect Tian of the Republic, passed by the National Assembly on October 6, 1948, ensure general propaganda conformity. While the Constitution guarantees freedom of expression under the protection of the state. The new law contains prohibitions against such crimes as unauthorized reporting, slander of the president of the republic, support or propagation of fascism and similar movements, abuse of a Nazi-ian or race, and propagation of news causing alarm. Eight a considerable part of the work of the Ministry of Information is directed at the maximization of the effectiveness of propaganda media through the work of research agencies. Two notable organizations are the Public Opinion Institute, responsible to the general information section of the ministry. And the Broadcast Listening Research Bureau, an important division of the broadcast section, their work in polling and content analysis affords an appraisal of the effectiveness of domestic propaganda. Another function of the ministry is one of conducting research and propaganda abroad through cultural attaches who work with Czechoslovak diplomatic authorities. It is noteworthy that personnel within the Ministry of Information did not change radically during the consolidation period following the February crisis. Two factors partially account for this: the first being the obvious one that between I-945 and 1948, many key offices were filled with communists by Minister Kopecky. Secondly, a considerable part of the operations of the ministry are technical and require skilled communications experts. It was impossible to replace all non-communist experts with those of the proper ideological orientation immediately, for there was a shortage of properly trained communists in the communications fields. Further, it was held that the security risk involved in retaining non-communists in the ministry was not as dangerous as in the active implementation of propaganda, and that. Gradual replacement would be more beneficial to long-range policy. A Czechoslovak Ministry of Information, the Constitution of the Czechoslovak Republic, Prague, 1948, p. 25. Conclusions. Certain conclusions follow from this study of propaganda administration in the initial consolidation period of communist power in Czechoslovakia. They may be restated in concise form to shed some light upon the techniques used by an authoritarian political group to build a monolithic society. Propaganda is a function of command in Czechoslovakia, i.e., an extension of state policy, with its administrative structure taking two forms at the outset: 
an official group before the public, and another group behind the scenes, the latter constituting the highest source of authority. Within the administrative hierarchy, power has been delegated to many specialized agencies with the result that, at least upon its creation and shortly thereafter, the machine was difficult to control from the top downward, although methods of coercion have been readily available. The ideal type of propagandist in Czechoslovakia today combines technical skill with an adherence to doctrine. While doctrine is the first prerequisite in most instances, deviations have been tolerated to utilize available skills. In general, Czechoslovak propaganda administration has been divided thus far into the three separate functions of planning, implementation, and control. 6i8 This content downloaded from 141.225.218.75 on Saturday, January 4, 2014, 10.06 and 30 seconds a.m. All you subject to JSTOR terms and conditions.